Good afternoon. I hope that you'll join me in thanking Health and Human Services Commissioner Jean Lambrew for filling in for Maine CDC Director Nirav Shah today as he uh, attends to some other business. Dr. Shah looks forward to returning here tomorrow, Diet Coke in hand. Uh, Commissioner Lambrew will be providing a, uh, an update today's, on today's case numbers in a few minutes. But first, I want to discuss a couple of updates since we last spoke. As many of you know, uh, this Thursday, my stay, stay healthy at home order is scheduled to expire. I continue to consult with the main CDC, with our coronavirus response team, and with many others to determine whether it would be appropriate to extend that order for some period of time. I expect to reach a, reach a final decision on that soon and very likely tomorrow. That decision, however, will be based on fact, on science, and on medical expertise. As of now, some type of extension seems likely because it seems warranted as we continue to turn the tide against this virus. The steps we are taking are having an effect. They are working, but we still need to stay the course. Last week, I also announced the four guiding principles that we'll, we'll be following when it comes to gradually restarting the economy. Those guidelines are first, protecting public health. Second, maintaining health care readiness. Third, building reliable and accessible testing. And fourth, prioritizing public-private cooperation. The Department of Economic and Community Development has been working closely with the Maine CDC, with the Department of Health and Human Services, to, de to develop a plan for reopening and shoring up our economy. DECD has already solicited feedback from more than 1,600 people and businesses and employees across diverse economies and sectors around the state through the portal that we announced last week. In addition to hundreds of consultations with industry leaders, nonprofits, uh, government people, unions, public officials, and so many, many interested citizens. The basic premise of the plan we're working on is this. Restarting certain business operations or activities will not be based on whether a business is considered essential or non-essential, which originally was used by the federal government to decide what businesses had to close their doors to limit personal interaction. Instead, we plan to open businesses gradually based on whether they can conduct business safely with all relevant public health guidelines. Those are the guidelines we're working on now. Those businesses, organizations, uh, or activities that can operate safely, even in some limited, maybe non-traditional fashion, by minimizing in-person interaction among customers and staff, those businesses will be among the first to reopen. Those that cannot do that will be among the last. At any point, if the loosening of certain restrictions causes a spike in COVID-19 cases, we'll be closing the door, the restrictions will have to be reinstated, and we'll try again. I hope to unveil that plan tomorrow. Regarding unemployment, which has been a big question for so many people, I know there are still so many people who have applied and who are awaiting for their first check awaiting their claim to be approved, waiting for their first check. Over 100,000 people who were gainfully employed at the beginning of March are now unemployed and applying for benefits just in the past several weeks. Almost 70% of those who have applied are now receiving benefits, including the added $600 weekly benefit authorized by Congress. The Maine Department of Labor has added more than 100 staff and has paid out over $200 million since March 15th in unemployment benefits. The Department of Labor has also expedited the determinations on nearly 20,000 pending claims that would have normally required fact-finding interviews. 
They're doing this in order to relieve the backlog and to bring certainty to the many people who are suddenly unemployed as fast as possible. We expect some additional guidance from the federal government this week to provide clarity about the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. Because it is intended for people who don't normally qualify for state unemployment benefits, like self-employed Mainers, we cannot simply tweak our existing program or change a knob on a computer. All the states are working hard to establish new systems to deliver this benefit, including Maine. And as Commissioner Fortman said last week, the Maine Department of Labor will be releasing the timeline this week for Maine's rollout of the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. In the meantime, our in unemployment insurance staff are working evenings and weekends to clear up application holds and the backlog and get benefits flowing as fast as possible. I say this to the people of Maine. I know that for so many of you, these last few weeks have been extraordinarily tough. Missed milestones with loved ones, birthday parties, baby showers, funerals, weddings, dwindling savings, isolation, staying at home, frustration and fear are all testing our endurance. Sometimes it feels like you're at the end of your rope. Well, Teddy Roosevelt once said, when you're at the end of your rope, tie a knot and hold on. Our efforts to beat this virus are working, so hold on. If we stay on this path, our numbers, our numbers should improve, and we can start on the road to recovery. I believe in Maine people. I believe we have a bright future. Stay the course and stay safe. Now, Commissioner Lambrew, I would welcome you to provide today's update. Thank you, Governor Mills. And I will begin with some sad news. I must report the death of a man in his 70s in Kennebec County of COVID-19. Our hearts go out to his family. That means to date, 51 people in the state of Maine have passed away from COVID-19. As of today, we have 1,023 confirmed cases. That is an increase of six from yesterday. There are 549 people who have recovered. That is an increase of 17 from yesterday. And all told, since the beginning of the epidemic, 161 people have been hospitalized. If we look at who's hospitalized today, there are 39 people in hospitals with COVID-19, 16 of them are in critical care, and seven of them are on ventilators. In terms of our available capacity, as of today, there are 169 critical care beds available, there are 298 ventilators available, and 394 alternative ventilators. So turning to our outbreaks, we do not have any new long-term care or congregate living facility outbreaks in the state of Maine. We've had a total of 268 cases to date in those settings for a total a percentage of 26% of all cases. We did have an individual who was at the Oxford Street shelter in Portland last week who also went to the wellness center at the Sullivan Gym in Portland which is where we are isolating people who are homeless to prevent the spread of COVID-19. That facility is set up with beds that are six feet apart, aggressive sanitation policies, aggressive mask wearing policy as well, but we decided out of an abundance of caution to test. And of the 96 people, residents and staff, who were tested at the Sullivan Gym and the Oxford Street Shelter, none were determined to be COVID positive. That is a sign that you can design wellness centers with the appropriate infection control and prevention practices that work. We will continue to monitor that situation. We also have 244 cases who are healthcare workers. Some of those are also reported in our long-term care outbreak, outbreak numbers. 
and we have no significant updates in terms of testing capacity or personal protective equipment. The numbers that Dr. Shaw typically gives can be, are available through Robert Long. The last point I'll make before we turn to questions is to flag that our main CDC has put up on its website new data visualizations. You can now see the cases by county, the trends, the rates, how Maine compares to other states, as well as our cases by age. So we will continue to post additional information as it becomes available to make sure that the Maine public knows what's going on on COVID-19 in the state of Maine. So with that, we'll turn to questions with the first coming from Jessica Piper from the Bangor, Bangor Daily News. Jessica. Hi there, um, Governor Mills, a question for you. Sure. Um, I, I know Governor Phil Scott announced yesterday sort of ways for businesses in Vermont to open under fairly specific health regulations. Are you considering something like that? And are you conversing with him or any other governors in the region as you contemplate a reopening? Yeah, the question was, you understand that Governor Phil Scott of Vermont has uh, issued some kind of reopening statement yesterday with strict guidelines. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, limits on the number of people who can be in a business at the same time. Right. That sort of thing. I, I think, and I think on Friday he modified his previous order about construction. He went further than many other states, including further than. He shut down construction, for instance. We'd never, we never shut down construction. So I think he's lifted that to the extent that two or three person jobs can be, can be done in, uh, legally in his state. Uh, so we are talking. Um, I, I speak, um, communicate regularly with Governor Sununu and Governor Scott about what they are looking at and when they're looking at doing things. We want to be in concert uh, so that uh, we'll have the same message across the northern New England states, the region. Uh, and we know that our numbers are quite different from Massachusetts, for instance. Massachusetts, uh, and we talked with Governor Baker as well, his numbers are just still surging, apparently, and um, as of late last week at least, and he's got a huge emergency on his hand. Um, we are fortunate we have not gotten there to, that, to, that, to those numbers. Um, and we think New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine have a lot more in common, a lot more similar similarities in numbers and economies and demographics, and it's perfectly appropriate for us to work together. Great. Thank you. Now we'll turn to Amy Brown from WERU. Amy, do you have a question? Excuse me. Thank you. This is for Governor Mills as well. Has the state been monitoring and enforcing the stay-at-home order at all? If so, how's that been going? And if we start ramping up gradually opening businesses will there be plans in place to also monitor that any type of enforcement yeah the question is have we been enforcing the orders have there been enforcement actions yes there have um, I read of one in the paper usually it's the local police and the local DA's office who enforce uh, criminal offenses um, particularly misdemeanor offenses uh, and there was one gentleman who was charged with violating the executive order he was also charged with some other things, carrying a weapon as a felon and violating a protection order, but be that as it may, our plan is to strictly enforce the orders as they uh, evolve, and not just industry by industry, but business by business, activity by activity. We don't want to give the impression that should we say that one particular sector may open up with these certain protocols or guidelines, that there'll be some flexibility built in or that you can be a little lax in one area or another. No, we expect to use our licensing power, our criminal enforcement powers, injunctive relief, every kind of relief to make sure that the, the public stays safe. Any activity, any business that deals with the public has got to be extremely cautious. Um, you know, I get letters from people who think, well, I'm only, I'm under 50, so I'm not really, um, susceptible to the virus. Well, that's just not true. And if you read the New York Times over the weekend and the Washington Post, there are people in their 30s who are having strokes, apparently connected with the virus, and people who are dying at early ages because of the virus, not simply because of respiratory symptoms. So um, it's so important that everybody in all sectors and all ages pay attention to what they're doing and how they're doing it, touching surfaces and interacting with other people. And I would just add, Governor, that the new data on the CDC website sites show that 55 percent 
of the people with COVID-19 in the state of Maine are under the age of 60. So it is a disease that affects us all. So next we'll turn to Mary Kate Mannion from WMTW. Mary Kate, do you have a question? Hi, good afternoon. I do. I hope that you can hear me. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, in the discussion, but I believe this will be directed to you, Governor Mills. Um, in the discussion of extending that stay at home order and possibly down the line for real businesses gradually, where does this fit in for a lot of uh, summer and tourism driven businesses and places like summer camps that may get a lot of out of state campers? Where do they fit into the picture and discussions at all? Great questions about. Uh, whether the stay-at-home order or any modifications to it will address tourism-based industries like I think you said like campgrounds um, or campers and things of that sort. That's exactly what we're looking at. How to modify things, what businesses may safely operate at what times and what time period um, so that we can carefully monitor um, the data, uh, the epi epidemiological impact, the impact on public health as things start to open up. I'm not going to comment on specific sectors you know, whether it's meals and lodgings, Airbnb, or uh, campgrounds, or summer camps at this point, but those are exactly the kinds of things that Heather Johnson and members of the industry and others and, and the CDC and Jean Lambrew's office are looking at right now. Great. So our next question is from Kate Koff from the Ellsworth American. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I yeah, two quick questions, both directed at Commissioner Lambrew. Um, the first is, can you tell us uh, whether the state is tracking the number of confirmed cases who are household members of a healthcare worker who has tested positive? And then the um, second question is, I'm wondering about vaccination rates for, you know, normal childhood hmm. vaccinations like measles, uh, mumps, rubella, that kind of thing. Can you talk about um, whether those numbers are dropping? And if so, are they, are they dropping to a point at which they might threaten herd immunity for those diseases? Sure. And for folks who couldn't hear it, the first part of the question was about health care workers. We have, as I mentioned earlier, in the state of Maine, 244 of our cases are health care workers. And the question was how many of those are, how many of our total cases are family members? We can look and see if we have those data and get back to you. So thank you very much for that. And on the second question, it was, have the, vac the childhood vaccination rates in the state of Maine dropped since COVID-19? We are actually looking at that right now because I did talk to colleagues from different states who report significant declines in the rate of childhood vaccinations because the recommendation to postpone non-urgent care is often taken by families to postpone time sensitive care. And we have repeatedly said to people in Maine, we want you to get the health care that you need. If you have diabetes and you need to get dialysis, if you have a chronic condition and you need health care, or if you need to protect your child from the important, you know, against the diseases that could potentially be devastating to children, get your children vaccine. We are going to continue as we are looking at our data and looking at what the governor is contemplating about what more we can be doing safely in the state of Maine, work with our health care providers because we are very uh, focused on making sure that all people in Maine get appropriate health care when needed. So thank you for that question. Next we'll turn to Steve Betts from the Courier Gazette. Steve, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Uh, for Governor Mills. Yes. Uh, Rockland has several major uh, summer festivals, the Lobster Festival, for instance, and these organizations uh, plan to make a decision by the first week of June. Will there be a direction from the state by that time on whether they can hold these events? Yes, there will be direction from the state of Maine by before early June, <clears throat> excuse me, to advise on whether or not crowd gathering events such as the Lobster Fest, which we all love, uh, and other such festivals can and should go on this summer. Great. So our next question is from Michael Fern from the Maine Edge. Michael, do you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you, Commissioner Lambert. I have one for you and one for Governor Mills. Uh, Commissioner Lambert, has the state begun receiving the new antibody tests? And Governor Mills, active cases dropped today to 423 from uh, 450 on Friday. Uh, with 26 percent of all cases happening in long-term care settings and that seems to be where the, most of the growth of cases is occurring 
Are your plans to reopen factoring in the transmission seems to be declining in parts of the state? And as a quick follow-up, you said, Wait, you said earlier about <laughs> Should we start by answering the first one? Sure. <laughs> Is that okay? Uh, what was it? Yeah, can you repeat the question? <laughs> uh, first question was about antibody tests. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are they, oh, yeah. Are, have we begun receiving them? Yeah. So I think as Dr. Shaw said previously, there's still work being done on the efficacy, the accuracy of the antibody tests that are coming onto the market. We are absolutely exploring all of our options, including ones that would be working here in Maine, effective here in Maine. So the short answer is, of course, we're looking at antibody tests as part of the larger strategy for the nation to begin to get back to normal in the age of COVID. But do we have tests available that are reliable in the state of Maine? Not yet. Keep Stay tuned. And your question for me was about whether we take into effect, into account, uh, the fact that uh, X percentage of the cases, positive cases, are related to long-term care facilities in determining how we restart the economy. I think that was your question, something like that? Uh, yes, it was. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't, I'm not sure that's a fair assumption. We're testing more in long-term facilities because by definition, if there's an outbreak of three or more, then we're testing more universally in those facilities. That doesn't mean that the virus isn't everywhere else or that other people aren't going to get it. And by the way, long-term care facilities includes rehabilitation facilities, places where people may go to recover from surgery or get therapy post-surgery. Um, and I think it's unfair to sort of think, well, people in long-term care facilities, maybe they don't represent the rest of the state. Well, they do, though, age-wise and demographically. They're not out of the, uh, out of the picture. And frankly, you look at the federal CDC guidelines that the president uh, has been touting in recent weeks, and it starts out by saying vulnerable populations, people who are vulnerable individuals should continue to stay home right through phase one, phase two, uh, and even being more cautious in phase three, as, as the federal government has described it. Well, when you look at the definition of vulnerable individuals from the federal CDC, it's anybody over the age of 65. That's 20% of Maine's population right there. It's anybody with high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, asthma, obesity, all kinds of underlying medical conditions uh, that, that um, encompass a great number of the people in the state of Maine. So everybody is potentially vulnerable. And then their household members are included in the national CDC guidance too. We can't assume that because you live in a particular area a particular kind of facility that you are more or less vulnerable to this virus. It's everywhere. Thank you. Now we'll turn to Kevin Miller from the Portland Press Herald. Kevin, do you have a question? Yes, hi. Uh, hi uh, Governor Mills, um, going back to your conversations with the governors of New Hampshire and Vermont, are you looking at coordinating the timing of any kind of reopening with them so that all three states kind of move forward at the same exact time in addition to kind of uh, reopening the same sort of businesses and because obviously New Hampshire has had a seems like they've had uh, kind of a surge in the past couple of weeks uh, not on the order of Massachusetts but certainly larger than, than Maine has had and then kind of a follow-up question on on testing are, are you feel like you're getting the governors are getting that the White House is getting the message from the governors um, over the past couple of weeks that they need to step up and really help the states out as far as testing capacity. Yes, I, I think we've been uniform and um, consistent on the message the governors have been giving to the federal government, to the vice, there's a call right now with the vice president, I'm not on it, but I'm sure they're discussing testing because we discuss in advance what the message will be and, and Governor Hogan who's the president of the Na National Governors Association, which I rejoined a little over a year ago, um, he's giving that message to the president and the vice president pretty consistently, and so are the rest of us, and so is the congressional delegation. Pretty uniform on that, but what kind of testing, too? Um, we all believe that universal testing or more uh, comprehensive testing is extremely important, not just to tamp down the virus now, but to prevent an outbreak later this year, this fall, or this coming winter. So yes, and on the question of uh, talking with the other governors of northern New England, yeah, we're, we're, not, we're not coordinating in an official fashion, but we are talking a lot and saying, well, what do you think about this, what do you think about that? When, when do you think you might roll out this or roll out that? And so I think it is, is important that we be consistent. 
At the same time, New Hampshire has a different relationship with Massachusetts than we do. Uh, they share a border with Massachusetts. Um, I was on a call the other day, and Governor Sununu mentioned that 80,000 people commute every day. 80,000 people commute from southern New Hampshire to Boston, the Boston area. And Governor Baker added that 20,000 people commute from Massachusetts into New Hampshire every day. We don't have that phenomenon. So that interplay with a, a state that has right now a very high incidence of COVID-19 cases uh, is, is another thing they have to accommodate, New Hampshire does, which we don't necessarily. So we are talking. I think we're getting, we're um, on the same page in many, many respects. Great. <clears throat> so our next question is coming from Dan Newman from the Maine De Beacon. Dan, what's your question? Um, yeah, hello. Uh, my question is for uh, Governor Mills. Um, in the statement from your administration on the budget today, um, you talk about uh, course readjustment and uh, reconsidering all expenditures and reserves in the light of the pandemic and the new budget situation. Mm -hmm. uh, will you also be reconsidering? Will, sorry, will you also be uh, uh, reconsidering uh, repealing some of the tax breaks for high-income earners that were maintained in the last budget passed last year? Um, is everything on the table? In that regard no you know we will have conversations with the appropriations committee in due course the steps that we take first of all we're calling in as you know calling in the Econ consensus economic forecasting commission those are the, that's the body of experts that the legislature and the administration rely on to not predict the future but to give us an accurate picture of what's going on in the economy they uh, then we call in the revenue forecasting committee uh, which then makes uh, assessments of revenue. For instance, the courthouses have been closed for a lot of business for now a month, uh, and so fines are not coming in the door, which they usually would be, things like that. So the Revenue Forecasting Committee um, actually uh, looks at those revenue data, uh, and we know it's not going to be real happy news, obviously, but to, to jump the gun and say that we're going to look at specific steps um, would not be appropriate at this time. We're going to listen to the experts first, talk to the Appropriations Committee about how we can uh, pare down the budget, uh, shave off expenditures, and, and, and uh, a lot depends on what the federal government does as well. Uh, there's been a lot of lobbying the federal government to allow the states, all states, to use the money that has been in the pipeline from the third COVID response stimulus package. Use that in more flexible ways. Right now, we're told by Mr. Secretary Mnuchin uh, that we can only use it to pay actual expenses. We've made money out the door for COVID-19 related um, uh, issues. Obviously, the revenue drops we're seeing, every state is seeing, are also due to the COVID-19 response. Uh, and in particular, when the federal government put off the income tax filing deadline to July, uh, and then the states of necessity did as well, you don't have the revenues coming in in this fiscal year that we're anticipating before. So for obvious reasons. Uh, so no, I'm not going to predict exact, uh, what exact steps will be taken uh, in the next six months or a year to adjust the budget, the state budget. Next, we'll turn to Brad Rogers from WGME. Brad, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, well, uh, mine is um, for Governor Mills. Uh, can you give us an idea of what areas of state government will be impacted by the hiring freeze and non-emergency spending freeze? And who will decide or how will it be decided uh, what's considered an emergency or not for spending? Our Commissioner of uh, Administration and Financial Services, Kirsten Fregora, has been issuing uh, guidelines, guidances to state employees for several weeks now about you know, stay in the course, but keep keeping a close eye on expenditures, uh, whether it's uh, the, the projected um, expansion of some service or building a new building or anything like that. We're just trying to hold the line with, in terms of hiring new people, particularly when it comes to the general fund. We have <clears throat> we have taken in federal funds and um, allocated them according to the budget. Excuse me. It's the water, but we have not. Uh, taken more specific steps that I can talk about without Kirsten chiming in. Got it. Mm -hmm. All right. So our next question comes from TJ Tremble from ABC7. TJ, what is your question? 
Good afternoon. Thank you. This is for Commissioner Lambrow. Uh, taking back the uh, testing issue, if we could, over the weekend, Dr. Fauci said testing needs to double on a national level over the next several weeks. Is that a feasibility in the state of Maine? So we have been looking at every and all option to expand our testing capacity. Some of it is what Governor Mills mentioned, asking the federal government for help because we really do need to ensure that when they have the resources, they are sharing not just with the states with hot spots, but with states like Maine where we can prevent hot spots. So we are obviously continuing to seek the support from the federal government that other states have gotten. We're also trying to figure out how we use innovation to get there. Can we find new partners? Can we use some of the rapid testing capacity in smart ways? We still are trying to validate this kind of rapid testing ID now that Dr. Shaw has talked about to make sure it works because that's key to making sure that we have a good, good testing capacity here in Maine. But we are obviously working every single day to do what we can do to expand testing capacity, contact tracing, as well as the personal protective equipment that will be needed as we move further along in containing the COVID-19 pandemic in Maine. So thank you for that question. Just a quick follow up. Sure. Commissioner Lambrew, what's your position on universal testing? So we have implemented a policy of universal testing in Maine, one of the first states to do so, in the context of an outbreak in a congregate living facility. So group homes, homeless shelters, nursing facilities, when we have an outbreak, we are doing universal testing, as I just mentioned, with the Sullivan Gym and the Oxford Street Shelter in Portland as a means of detecting, isolating, and preventing the spread of COVID-19. When we look at the other strategies that are being contemplated, the framework that was put out 10 days ago by the federal government does contemplate getting to a point where all symptomatic people can be tested, as well as sentinel testing, which means in likely areas where we're doing more random testing, more testing of everybody in certain sectors as we begin to increase our testing capacity so we truly can detect outbreaks before they spread. So we are working hand in glove with trying to expand our capacity on one hand and then have our strategies to smartly deploy that testing on the other. But again, Maine has been a leader in universal testing in long-term care facilities. So thank you for that. So now we'll turn to Brian Sullivan from WABI. Uh, Brian, are you there? Do you have a question? Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, my question is for Governor Mills. I was wondering if you could explain a little bit the process that a business uh, has to go through in order for them to advocate for their reopening and how that plays out. I know we'd seen that the Hobby Lobbies were allowed to open across the state. Could you just explain to us a little bit about uh, how that came to be and maybe when they actually applied to reopen and then how long passed between they were actually being allowed to reopen. Yeah, I can't comment on that on a specific business. <clears throat> you know, um, the Department of Economic and Community Development has been real busy the last five weeks uh, taking in inquiries from thousands of business entities and, and people who engage in different activities and trying to make the best determination they can based on the information they have. I can't comment on that specific one because I'm not, I'm not intimately familiar with it. Uh, so, but the process basically, oops, now we have a portal. People, 1,600 people have made suggestions through the uh, DECD portal, uh, but also people are writing to the DECD to ask for uh, a letter authorizing them to do business or do business in a particular way. Again, always keeping in mind uh, personal safety and um, distancing measures. All right, so next we have Dustin from New England Cable News. Dustin, do you have a question? Hi, uh, the question is for Governor Mills. So two recent studies show Maine is having an especially vulnerable economy to the business impacts of the virus. Do you agree with that sentiment? And you talked about convening the economic forecasting committees early. Does that show we have an especially serious problem? It shows that we have a problem. Thank you for the question. It's about whether or not I agree with uh, uh, something that says that we have a worse economic problem or prospects than many other states. I'm not sure I agree with that, uh, but I'm not the economist. Uh, and the economists are the people who are on the economic <clears throat> consensus economic forecasting commission. They're the ones who will tell us where we're going and what it looks like. And I, I trust them to give us a competent professional an accurate picture of things. 
I think other states are doing something very similar, calling in their experts now, uh, developing an economic recovery plan that includes all demographics, all issues. Um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say to um, 11, 12 years ago, I was in the legislature. I was on the Appropriations Committee for four of the six years I was in the legislature. I was on the Appropriations Committee during the last recession. I know, I know how extremely difficult it is to pare back and to examine every item in the state budget and to do everything you can to make sure that the public safety and public health and children's education are preserved to the highest degree practical, highest degree possible. And at the same time, uh, avoid raising taxes and fees, but get the job done that state government has to, be, has to get done and examine new ways of doing business and new ways of uh, increasing revenues into the state of Maine. So uh, I'm ready for that job again. So our next question is from Steve Missler from Maine Public Radio. Steve, are you there? Yes, thank you. Thank you for taking the question. Governor Mills, it is um, uh, two quick questions, really. Um, one is about testing and um, uh, the federal government's um, assurances that it will help. Are you, do you feel as if you're getting enough support from them or that you will get enough support from the feds in terms of whether it's getting the supplies you need to do to complete the tests? And then the second question is a budget-related one where um, I think it was the National Association of State Budget Officers or NASBO, um, I think the head of that agency or that organization said that um, state budget cuts will be the worst seen in decades in terms of percentage. I guess I, not knowing exactly what you're dealing with, and unless you want to share some of that information ahead of um, what the forecasting committee provides later on this summer, do you have a sense of what you're facing now um, and also, do you know how much help you might need from the feds if they actually take the strings off some of this stimulus money um, and let you spend it to adjust budgets? Wow, that's two big questions. Uh, first on testing, you know, the proof is in the pudding. What's happened in recent weeks, uh, among other things that have happened, is that the federal government, for instance, once the FDA authorized the rapid testing mechanism that Abbott Labs developed. We then found that the federal government <clears throat> issued purchase orders, basically buying up a great percentage of the uh, great portion of the supplies and test kits, and then distributing them, I think unevenly, but not irrationally. They've been giving those test kits to entities operating in the hot spots, uh, Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, you know, Rhode Island, places where the outbreaks are really hot, and I understand why they might focus on that. At the same time, I keep making the pitch on our calls, as does uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, Montana, other uh, more rural states, that we want to avoid becoming hot spots. So we need more test kits and test uh, reagents and, and swabs and the materials that, go, materials that go with those tests to prevent us from becoming a hot spot, from preventing a surge. So. We keep making the case. Uh, the proof is in the pudding. We'll see what happens. On the second issue about um, the budget, uh, it would be really jumping the gun for me to say <clears throat> that we will lose X number of dollars or that we will need X number of dollars uh, to put together the supplemental, a supplemental budget or the next biannual budget. It's really premature for me to do that. Um, but I do talk to our budget people constantly. And we're keeping an eye on the month-to-month -month revenues. Obviously, they're down. Uh, I fully expect that every state is down in revenues, both sales taxes and income taxes. Uh, and I imagine the, the towns and cities are uh, not collecting as much in property taxes as they would have anticipated. So we'll look at those as, as, uh, as things go along. I don't have a specific proposal or um, uh, I can't speculate as to the amounts right now. We do want to see guidance from the federal government that's broader, gives us more flexibility to, to light a fire under our economies and to keep our people safe. Great. And our last question is from Cindy Williams from New Center. So Cindy, do you have a question? Oh, yes, I do. 
Hi there. I'm sorry. I must have been hearing a, a, a reverb or something. Uh, I have two questions, one for Governor Mills and one for Commissioner Lambrew. Um, let me start with you, Governor Mills. I am. We are hearing from small business owners all over Maine who are frustrated and obviously reeling financially. Um, as an example, uh, one small tiling company, for example, isn't allowed to have tough customers even though they are practicing responsible social distancing and hygiene, mm. whereas Home Depot two miles away is free now to service all of their customers with no additional restrictions. How do you address that disparity? And as you move toward opening up, giving favor to those with minimal interaction, how do you fix that? Oh, boy. Well, it's a question of the hour. There are disparities. Inevitably, there are disparities, and, and it's regretful. Um, I don't like seeing that. It bothers me that some stores, retail stores, are closed, partly because they don't have the physical distance, physical capacity to accommodate six feet distances between customers and staff or between or among customers. Other stores have larger retail spaces, and they're, they're open for all kinds of purposes. That bothers me. It does. And we are trying to accommodate that in the guidance that we're developing now, which will include um, what kind of personal interactions occur, whether you have plastic uh, she uh, plexiglass shields and uh, gloves or face coverings, whatever might be required in the circumstance. I can't comment on the, per on the specific business you're talking about, and I don't know whether they've been in touch with uh, the main CDC. DECD, excuse me, uh, on that issue. But thank you for the question. All right, my second question for uh, Commissioner Lambrew. Uh, sometime last week, Dr. Shaw had mentioned that we have a 4% uh, death rate, but we know that that's not really accurate given the few tests that we are doing. We know there is a huge population out there who may have it and have not um, been tested. Can you give me some indication as to what percentage of people who are exhibiting symptoms are actually getting tested right now? Sure, and the question was about death rates and symptoms. And I do want to pull back a little bit and say, while one way to calculate a death rate is the number of people passing away from COVID-19 amongst the people who have been tested, the other way that we've seen is the death rate per capita, meaning the denominator is the number of people in the state of Maine. And I haven't checked since I think last Thursday, but Maine was in the bottom 20 of all states in terms of our death rate per capita last week, whereas when you look at our overall death rate, that was the COVID-specific COVID death rate per capita, when you look at our overall death rate, we're in the top 20 because of our age. So to repeat, we were in the bottom 20 of states with COVID deaths per capita, whereas we're in the top 20 in terms of overall death rates per capita, which shows that we are hopefully doing something to prevent the spread of COVID-19 among people at risk, those vulnerable people that the governor spoke about, as well as um, our older residents. But going to people who exhibit systems, uh, symptoms, as I mentioned earlier, our goal is as soon as possible to get sufficient testing so that anybody who we suspect has COVID-19 can get tested so we really can be better at trying to identify those people, identify their contacts, making sure that they self-isolate so they are not spreading the disease in their communities and then hopefully putting those people on the path to be reco to recovery. Again, as we said earlier, the good news in Maine is we have more people recovering than are currently getting COVID-19, but that's only because of the protections that the governor continues to talk about that we put in place to make sure Maine is safe. Okay. So right now, though, the tests are still being rationed um, in a way. So, so, um, I, I, well, <laughs> not rationed. Yeah. How, do you have any, well, not rationed, but not everybody who is exhibiting symptoms is able to get a test. So so when do you, do you have any kind of timeline uh, to where we can finally get to a place where if people are sick, they'll be tested? Yeah. None of us, governor on down, are happy about the fact that we do not have the type of testing capacity that we would like in the state of Maine. It is not for lack of trying. Uh, I am a witness to the fact that the governor on virtually every call with Washington will raise this concern. Dr. Shaw and his team are every day looking at the private sector. Where are there different testing platforms? What are the different testing models? Are there new testing techniques that could expand our capacity? 
So we are working earnestly, aggressively to do what we can do to test people. But as a reminder, for people who are not in the categories that we are testing, healthcare workers, first responders, older, older people in Maine, we're testing people who should they have COVID-19, we want to qu quickly and aggressively make sure that they get treatment. The people with lower risk, their advice is probably the same. Stay home, self-isolate, take care of yourself because that is the way, testing or not, people recover from COVID-19. Okay, thank you. Is that it for questions? It is. Well, it's been a yes. pleasure uh, co-hosting with you today. I am no Nero Shah when it comes to co-hosting oh. these events, but he will be back. He'll be back, hopefully yes. tomorrow. Yes. Uh, in the meantime, let me just say the rent relief program that I announced here, I think about two weeks ago, is, go is strong, is going well. There have been 4,604 applications and 2022 uh, processed uh, checks of $500 going out to landlords to pay people's rent. We still have capacity to process rent relief uh, checks. If you go online at Maine Housing backslash COVID rent, uh, you can get some help there. We're helping in every way we can for as long as we can. Um, and I look forward to seeing everybody tomorrow. And by the way, there's several people who emailed me saying that I must have cheated and gone to a beauty salon. Wrong. Just want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I think your hair is lovely, Governor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and we generally call it the CDC press briefing. However, Dr. Nirav Shah, the director of the Maine CDC, was not there today, but uh, Commissioner Lambrew was and Governor Mills. Tackle, ta I'll tackle the numbers first. Uh, one new fatality uh, since yesterday, a man in his 70s in Kennebec County, uh, which brings to 51 the number of people who have died in Maine from COVID-19. Uh, six more cases reported today, up to 1,023, 500 49 recoveries that's 17 more people than yesterday and uh, 39 people uh, in the hospital 16 in the ICU most of the questions and uh, the governor addressed it even before the questions began um, were about opening up the state in some way or form uh, how it will be done when it will be done governor mills uh, mentioning that in three days the stay-at-home order expires. Will she extend it? She kind of hinted that perhaps she would in some shape or form, and she talked a little bit about the criteria for opening things up. Number one would be a focus on public health, obviously, and health care readiness, also an increase in testing, and uh, a look toward public and private cooperation with uh, the businesses and organizations in the state of the Maine. So what do you need in the state of Maine? So what do you need to do to restart? Well, um, Governor Mills did say that, that the decisions won't be based on essential or non-essential businesses and employees necessarily, but instead on how whatever businesses can open up can do it in a responsible way, meaning keep social distancing, uh, provide uh, masks and gloves for people coming in and their employees wearing them and uh, minimizing in-person contact and, and she did mention too that if slowly things do open up and there's a sudden spike in cases then she'll close things right back down again. Uh, when will she make this announcement? She kind of hinted that tomorrow might be the day. Um, she says she's been talking very closely with uh, the governors of Vermont and New Hampshire, uh, similar numbers in those two states, similar uh, terrain in terms of more uh, rural population. And um, interestingly, Vermont is opening things back up. Will that play a role in what happens to Maine? We don't know yet, but perhaps we will find out tomorrow. So that's just a quick briefing on what uh, just happened at the CDC briefing from Augusta. Uh, I'll send you back to regular programming. We'll be back with you at 5 o'clock with much, much more. And of course, you can watch us all day long on uh, the web and on our social media pages as well. Thanks for watching. Have a good day. Stay safe.